Okay. All right, so we're ready to go. The TV is running. So, um, and we're live. Uh, and all mistakes, it's just going to happen. So, uh, so, again, you've asked us to come here and talk a little bit about how things have changed in our field uh, since uh, September 11, 2001. Um, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, everything has changed. Everything. And yet, not real. Uh, because we're always in that mode anyways, uh, but how we do things, how we approach things, that's the real change. You know, I can tell you that from the fire side, um, that uh, we were out doing a lot of things anyways. Right? We were not only responding to calls, but we are doing a lot of convention stuff throughout the schools, just like them, just like the PD. And we were being very proactive in everything we did, whether it was being proactive or responding to emergencies, was pretty singular in nature. And, 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 and I mean that in a way where if I go out and I talk to a child or I talk to a senior population, um, we're talking about the specifics of your daily life, right? We're going to talk about, okay, we're going to talk about how to get your medications right. We're going to talk about how we're going to have the file of life done. When I go out to the schools, we're going to talk about a myriad of things, but everything involves being home or being at school and reacting to something or, or preventing something. But it's something that you see every single day. That's what we did. And it was, it was simple. It wasn't a big picture thing. It was, it was, let's focus on one little problem at a time, figure out how to deal with that problem, figure out how to fix the problem before it becomes a problem. But it's simple. We did the same thing when we were out in the community looking at buildings, if we're looking at code enforcement, or we're looking at inspections and things like that. It was very specific to the structure itself. So if I come in here, I'm taking a look at the structure, I say, okay, uh, your sprinkler system, which you don't have, by the way, um, <laughs> you, your, your fire alarm system, which is marginal at best. Um, we all feel safer now. <laughs> It'll be better in the new place. Um, the, all of those things were specific to that building and what that building was used for. So whether it was here and we have a congregation of people, uh, so it's, it's a high occupancy, uh, so there's a risk to that, or whether it's a warehouse where the materials being stored impact what the fire load is, which impacts what's going on with the building, all of that we looked at specific. So we didn't go outside of things. Everything was in a silo. So if I looked at a building, I made sure that not only did it meet all the codes, so that was part of my prevention, that they did things right when they built it, part of our prevention, and if there was an incident there, we took care of it, and it was right dead on. It began and it ended at that building. In our relationships, we had good relationships with many. Um, Ron and I actually uh, worked together in the schools 20 years ago. Um, it's close to 18, but who's counting? I, I lose track. <laughs> no, I'm hiring those kids. <laughs> uh, but you know what? We did it independently. Um, there were very few occasions in which we teamed up. We had a, a few exceptions. Mike Ellsworth and I mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of stuff at the middle school level together. Uh, but th that was an exception. We really worked independently from one another. We knew of each other, uh, meaning the two departments. We worked well with each other when we were at incidents. But that's the only time we intersected. We didn't really address things together. We didn't look at things in a broad picture. One of the things that the fire department does is employ, employ a method of, of handling events that's called incident command system, ICS. That's something we've been doing for 20 some odd years. And uh, that's the nature of our business because everything we do, we do in teams. Uh, we do it together. I never go out with another, without another person. Always. Always. It's always a team. So to be able to run a team, you have to have discipline, you have to have order, and the way to have that is, is this system called incident command, in which everything is a building block. So from the smallest incidents to the largest incidents, we were able to take, okay, apply this and this, well, we don't need all these other blocks right now. But if the incident gets bigger, I can just take those blocks and plug them in. So I go with a couple guys. In theory, I have somebody who's commanding. I have somebody who's doing the work. 
I have somebody who's doing communication, I have somebody who's getting me all the stuff, right? So all that's happening, but you, you kind of do it all together. So in a very small incident, the blocks are not really together from a lot of places. An incident grows, those blocks come from different places. Now, if I'm command, I'm singular in that nature, I'm just command, I'm not also carrying a hose with me. I'm just talking on the radio, I'm telling people where to go. And then I have people who are doing the work, and they're another block. Then I have somebody doing all the communications, they're another block. And then I have help coming in, they're another block. Uh, and it grows and it grows and it grows. But what we didn't do is that we didn't play with them like that. And to their defense, we didn't play like that with anyone. It's, <laughs> it's, it is, so this is where, this is where 9-11 exposed a massive flaw in the way that our intelligence gathering and dissemination is handled throughout the entire country as it relates to law enforcement. It, it, and what it did is it exposed the fact that the police departments, in general, they operate sort of a silo. And what would happen is, is that we would look at everything as a criminal matter, right? And we would look to see whether or not we were gonna be able to solve that problem eight hours at a time, as I used to say when I worked shift. But then if we couldn't figure out a police remedy to the problem, what we would find is, is that that's usually where the problem died on the desk of whoever it was that was handling it. It's kind of like building a house, right? You got electricians, you got framers, you have all these different specialties, okay, that all go into building a house. No one can actually do it in and of themselves, but if they don't communicate with each other, if they don't talk, if they don't say, hey, I just got this information about, for instance, weather, right? How many, I, I mean, everybody in here built a house at some point or another in their life? Weather affects that? If, if the framer knows that there's gonna be, say, a heavy, heavy rainstorm and he doesn't tell anybody else and they show up and it turns into a complete mess, right? It's the same scenario with policing. Now, the one thing that the fire service had all over us was incident command, ICS. <laughs> I know, yeah, he's used to me doing this. And it, because of the fact that they were used to showing up and handling things on this large scale and understood the fact that when you get to basically what ICS is, is it's nothing more than a mass collaboration. It's this, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's multiple, multiple disciplines all communicating with each other in real time to identify what problems are and then get resources to it as soon as possible to remedy the problem. Well, police service really didn't handle it all that well. And after 9-11, it kind of basically got shoved down the police service's throat. After 9-11, they said basically, hey, get your act together. Start following ICS. Everybody has to learn it now. Now, how have things changed since then? Well, as it relates to terrorism, I can tell you that I belong to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We meet quarterly in Boston, or now Chelsea, with the FBI headquarters, and we sh there's sh information sharing, right, <laughs> as it relates to terrorism, as it relates to large venue threats like we have here at the Xfinity Center, as it relates to anything that could be considered what they refer to as a soft target. Where we still are struggling as a profession to learn those same lessons is in just about every other area. Right? So after 9-11, we all got punched in the eye. We figured it out with terrorism. Now what we're doing is, is that what we're trying to do is creep that same theory, that same process, that same mass collaboration. We're trying to put it together for other avenues. So a good example of that is the opioid crisis that we're dealing with. It, you hear from a lot of police chiefs that we are not going to, quote, we are not going to arrest our way out of this problem because we've tried. And all we've done is we filled up the jail cells, they get out of jail, they go right back, and it's this vicious cycle that just goes over and over and over again. So what have we had to do? We've had to start taking a virtual ICS approach to the way that we handle the problem. We've gotta work hand in hand with the fire department. We've gotta get Narcan out there, right? To start saving lives as quickly as possible. We've gotta start working together with uh, mental health professionals, because realistically we're talking about issues of addiction, realistically if we, if we get to root cause. 
We've got to start working with probation. We've got to start working with a whole host of uh, detox facilities. We've got to reach out to organizations like Learning to Cope and, and, and Jim Derrick's organization and a whole lot of host of organizations that can provide a support network. That basically is ICS in, one, in, in, in a small regard and the fact that we've got to understand that we may not be, we know we need the resource. We know we've got to get to the resource and we've got to get the resource to the people that need it most. How do we communicate with that? and create direct lines of communication instead of, again, operating in a silo and, hand, and using just one tool to try and approach every single problem. So on the one hand, with, with regards to the topic, how have we changed things? Well, with terrorism and quite frankly with large venue threats, we've gotten pretty good at communication as far as federal, state, local, when it comes to other areas, the one thing that we haven't been as quick to pick up on in the last 17 years is that the lesson that we should have taken from 9-11 is those valuable communication skills that ICS incorporates into it. We should be applying to every single other area, whether we're dealing with the mental health crisis that we're dealing with right now, right? where we should be looking at embedded mental health professionals and getting people in here that realistically know what they're looking at at the time that they're looking at it, whether we're dealing with the opioid crisis, whether we're dealing with domestic abuse and such, right? All these issues combined to, to basically these are the lessons that we should be that we should have learned, and that quite frankly we're a little slow to pick up on, but we are picking up on in the profession. Make no mistake about it. This is a very proactive town. Uh, we're very aggressive in terms of doing exactly that, and we've made already huge strides in, in doing that kind of thing. There are there are communities where police and fire don't talk at all. Uh, but in this community, and they're proud of it, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> no, yeah, he's, he's not kidding. I, I talk. I, I go to other towns, and they're like, "Oh, you're moving in with the fire department? Oh, to heck with those guys. I don't even want to see them." And then, how do you operate? Like, how do you operate? Like, how do you do that? Like, how do you run? How do you how do you respond effectively and deliver services to to your to your community if that's your attitude? Because and that's every, cultural. Everything we're doing, we do together. Everything. So we I'll take the schools, for example. So the schools predominantly, as you will know, for our, the last, since our, 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 uh, the fire in Chicago, uh, Our Lady of Saints fire, uh, in which you know, a whole school of, of, of elementary age children perished in a fire that was absolutely preventable. Uh, so, I mean, it was before fire codes were in place, really, and fire drills were non-existent, so fire drills became a big part of this, right? So fire drills, we do fire drills all the time, all the time. You know what we do now? We don't just do fire drills anymore. We do drills to make sure these kids are prepared for a violent act. Sad, but we have to be prepared for that. So we've taken that initiative and done it together so that we can find ways to measure ourselves to make sure that we're not overlapping, that there's no confusion, um, and that both agencies know exactly what's going on. When we do a lockdown drill, they take the lead. You know why? Because it's their game. We fall to a support role. When it's a fire drill, we take the lead because that's our role, and they support us. And it's a real yin and yang, and it's easily done, and we're very aggressive in terms of how we get this out to our troops and make sure that they understand it as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's well done. But it's not just there. We, we actually practice this thing up at uh, practice, I say. We employ it uh, at the Xfinity Center every single concert. There's a trailer. The trailer sits a police officer, a security person, a firefighter who's in charge, uh, the person who does the transporting for the ambulance company. And we sit in there together. And all decisions are made jointly. It's called a unified command. And at its very heart, it's the heart of ICS. It really is. It's at the very heart of ICS is that communication tool. It is basically getting a representative from each, whether it's logistics, it's operations, so on and so forth, all getting them into the room together so that they can start moving resources at the same time without tripping over each other. Right. Absolutely. And then when we look at education, uh, particularly for the kids, we talk about joint efforts. 
Now we're in the schools, now the DARE has kind of fallen on hard times, and that's something I think everybody was kind of familiar with, DARE, but he's changed that. He's changed it into something entirely different and much, much more productive. Uh, we continue to do, he, he has uh, uh, people actually in the school. You want to talk about that? No, yeah, so we have, uh, we have, we were very proud to add our second SRO this year. And that, by the way, is to the credit of, uh, of the superintendent of schools, Teresa Murphy, and to the school committee, because uh, they recognized, they recognized what a tremendous resource one school resource officer was. And uh, they actually helped find the money to pay for the second, to help pay for the second SRO to go into the schools. And the way that we equate it is, is that now, as it relates to DARE, my, my big problem with DARE, and I taught the curriculum at one point, my big problem with DARE was that it was too rigid as it relates to the amount of time that you were spent actually delivering curriculum, and it didn't give enough time to sit down and talk to kids and actually interact with kids and parents and stuff. Because literally, when I, when I was teaching the curriculum, I had a full, full day's worth of classes. And you went from class to class to class to class, and occasionally you would walk through the lunchroom, and I'd try and steal as many snacks as I possibly could <laughs> as I made my way through them. But the thing that we tried to change when it came to our interactions with kids and with parents and such was to free up the officer to actually become, again, the emphasis being the word resource in school resource officer. Because what the SRO does is it takes problems that have been over the, over the years dumped on the vice principal's desks. And it's not, it's not a school problem, but it becomes a school problem. And we have a vast network of resources that we can reach out to, whether it be juvenile probation, whether it be mental health professionals, whether it be you know, any number of different type of resources that we can reach out to on behalf of the family and then start working with the family and the schools to start putting everybody together. The, the one thing that we've sort of, the one thing, and not to get off topic, but the one thing that I have found that we've sort of gotten away from over the years, I know I get off topic a lot. <laughs> the one thing that we've gotten away from is, is allowing educators to be educators. Because you look at the realities, right? Now we're talking post 9-11. You look at the realities that we face every single day as parents, as grandparents, as police, as, as, you know, as public safety officials. And the responsibilities today are vastly different than the viewpoint and the responsibilities that we all would have looked at them back in, say, the 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s. It's a whole different world. The problem is, is that we're not allocating the resources to the schools at times as it relates to dealing with specific matters, taking the issues off their plate, and basically the schools are still tasked with making sure all of our kids are educated, but then think about everything else that we put on their plates as well. And that's the emphasis of the SRO program, is, is to go in there, sit with, the, sit with the faculty, sit with the administrators, figure out exactly what it is that they're dealing with day to day, the big, the big problems that are impacting children's well-being and mental health, and see if we can't get to the root cause of the problem, right, and then help that family through it. You know, whenever there is, if we have an overdose in town that affects a family, the SRO knows about it, the SRO is able to tell the school about it, we get the adjustment counselors involved, okay? So I want you to picture it this way. In the silo of the way we used to do things, we would show up if we had an overdose. We hopefully would save them. Into the ambulance they'd go, off they'd go to the hospital. We would do a report, maybe we'd, you know, we'd file a, 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 a report with the Department of Children and Families, and then that was it. Well, for somebody, perhaps a child, who was involved in that, they now go have, they go into school the next day. They've got to focus, mind you, they're still a child. They've got to focus on their school day and everything else. And in the event that they start to act up, the schools don't have the information, which means that they, again, operating in a silo, right, make a decision based on the child's behavior not understanding context to it, and then it begins this downward spiral for the kid. In the meantime, if all we do is we communicate, we can provide context, and quite frankly, we can have that, say, we can have that support network built before the kid even gets into this classroom. The, t the, the adjustment counselors know, the school psychologist knows, the faculty, the administration know, so that, okay, how do we, how do we, help, how do we help this child in this particular situation? Again, the lessons of ICS. That we should uh, that we 
begun to incorporate into the profession as a whole. So as we look forward in, in just in that particular endeavor, uh, education in the schools, we, we look at joint efforts where we are now uh, addressing the situations where we need to teach kids how to be safe in bigger places. It's not just home. It's not just school. It's if they're going to a hotel or out at a sporting event or a concert or they're out at the mall or someplace like that. So how do you react? How do you move? What do you look for? Uh, what are some of the things that can keep you safe? Um, for instance, me, my family, my family just hates going to hotels with me because we can't stay above the fourth floor because the tower or the ladder is not going to reach me up there. It's not going up any higher than that, and that's the size it goes. So uh, I'd like to get down some way. So, you know, those little things like that. So we look at the big picture. So when we look at some of the things that have happened after, that's, that's really what we're doing. It's, it's we're looking at the big picture. We look at our schools up here, very unique situation. As you all know, it's a campus style. Nobody has all their schools in one spot. We have preschool through grade 12 in the same exact location. Awesome, right? It's incredible. What a learning opportunity for them. Terrible for us. Right? So typically in a smaller situation, we're able to use the resources within. If I have to move, if there's a gas leak or a small fire, I can move a school out entirely, put it in another school, and we can figure it out from there. We have everything in place to make sure that everybody's safe, evacuation. They get kids, they get over a thousand kids out of a school in less than three minutes. Isn't that amazing? And accounted for. Not only are they out, they tell us what's going on. Part of things that we've learned from 9-11 is accountability, making sure everybody knows where everybody else is. But now, we don't just look at it as just a single school moving. We look at it four to 5,000 people, we might have to evacuate off-site entirely. And how do we do that? We've been working for two years to come up with a plan to make this work, and we're there. We got it. We got the plan. Let's hope we never use it. But we've worked a long time to figure it out. And that's one of the big things that's changed, It's the big picture. When we look at places now, I go to a building, I don't just see a building, I see, well, what is, what's the impact on the area around it? What's going to happen here? How do I deal with all those people? Why did that happen? I can't take for granted that the train station, there's an incident at the train station because it was an accident. I have to consider the alternatives, and so does he. And that makes our scope of operations potentially enormous. As it is, if we have an issue at the train, if somebody was just to be hit by a train, our, our work scene is probably a mile long. That's a huge area, not only to work and try to run your aid, but to try to protect. So really big deal. Uh, if there's a train that's had an issue and it's gone off the rails, we have some other thoughts to think about here. And we're working with not just he and I. We have the trains, we have the state, we have all sorts of federal agencies that want to know what's going on and they have to be part of the picture. So ICS has allowed us to, to ramp that up and do it quickly, very, very quickly. And um, that is a real huge bonus. When we look at what, all the population in town, including you, one of the things that we're changing is how we do delivery of inoculations. Now a flu clinic is a flu clinic is a flu clinic, right? It's the same thing. We're going to do it. But if we have to do something bigger, if there was a re release of, say, anthrax someplace, mm -hmm. I have to inoculate 24,000 people. How am I going to do that? We got a plan. We have a plan. And we're working it out. And you know what we're doing? We've been working together. Actually, Joe's been on several meetings already, working with the health department and ourselves, uh, police, um, and COA. And we're talking about how to effectively do this in what we call a new system called potting system. How to break out areas so we don't have this huge influx into one place. How we can make it manageable, say for instance, for you. Imagine having to go to some place where 24,000 people are uh, and, and everybody's fighting for the same place in line. Well, let's isolate. Let's make the seniors a place for the seniors to go just for seniors. Let's make different areas specific to those areas. And let's get small crews out there, break it up, attack it like that. So it's changed the way we think about things. We think of things, about things more globally.
how are we going to affect much, much grander things than just that simple event? And that's a big deal. And that's what ICS, and I know we keep on going back to that, that's what ICS allows us to do. One of the other big things that's changed is radios, communication. Huge change in communications. Radios were, you know, pretty archaic prior to. Uh, they, they worked, sometimes they didn't work, nobody really cared. It's not that you didn't care, but you just accepted it. Now it's critical. Uh, because we know that uh, nothing else works when a big event hits. As you well know, so it felt so, you, it, you told me, how long did it take for her to contact home? Eight hours? Over eight hours. That's incredible. That's incredible. So we have to find a way around that. And we, and we, and we have. And we do. Uh, and part of it is our radio system. And all these radio systems now are made so that they're compliant to be able to go into the next century, have X amount of channels, uh, run certain frequencies uh, that are dedicated to public safety. And of course, as we look at what we're specifically doing here in Mansfield, again, we're looking globally. We knew our system couldn't tolerate a big impact situation. We've had some major incidents here in Mansfield, and frankly, they've tested us to the maximum of what we can handle. Anything above that, we know we're going to fail. And so we had to, we had to figure a way to get through that. And the way we got through that Justin. is to look at, well, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> I so apologize. Um, <laughs> the way we got through that is looking at it through a regional level. Big picture, outside the silo. So now we're not just working police and fire together, we're working police and fire in every single town around us, on the four communities around us, and probably will grow very, very quickly. And so we look at a place that's able to, the place we're going is over in Foxborough, it's called High Rock. They have an antenna there that can reach all the way to the water and to the North Shore. From Amazing. Chelsea to New Bedford. Amazing. So if we've done that, we've corrected a lot of the problems that we've had with our radio system. We look at things globally now uh, to be able to fix the problems that we couldn't fix because our budgets were also so tight. Everybody fights for money in a small town. There's only so many taxes. So how do you get around that? You go outside the box and you say, let's all pool our money together. Let's figure it out from there. And so we did. And that'll work. Not only will it get us better things, it's going to get us a, a better environment better trained people, better equipment, and it's all going to be for less money because we pooled our resources and got the state involved as well. So these are the kind of things that we're trying to do um, since 9-11 is tight outside the box, working together, breaking down the silos, opening up lines of communication, thinking of everything in a global sense. And, and really, when it comes down to it, implementing incident command system that buildable block model for every single thing we do. And uh, that's been a challenge, and it continues to be a challenge. The, the, biggest, the biggest single, I, I, I often say, the biggest single innovation in, in law enforcement, in policing of the last 50 years is the implementation of regional, is, is a widening, I should say, of regionalization of certain services. As an example, this morning, um, we, we executed a search warrant in a neighboring community. And because of the risk involving firearms and a number of other issues, we activated the regional response team to execute that search warrant. Now, that consists of about 30 to 40 police officers, right? Which is, quite frankly, more than Mansfield or that neighboring community can supply. But because we belong to a regional coalition called Metrolec, which is 40 plus cities and towns and two sheriff's offices, every town can send a person. And they can all train together every single Wednesday. So sometimes you'll hear it at the range. We share, we share our range with them sometimes too. Us, as well as other communities, what we do is we rotate the range through different communities because we share the wealth. But what that allows us to do though is, is it allows us access to resources like you know, a regional SWAT team. It allows us resources like regional uh, crisis negotiating team, regional mobile operations team, so that Boston Police, every single, every single World Series, every single Super Bowl, every single major incident in Boston, 
the first place that Boston PD calls for backup is to Metrolec to send in our resources as well to help them. So that we help them basically, there are three C's they call them to any major incident. You want to contain, you want to coordinate, you want to communicate. And those three C's are accomplished in part because of the resources that we can help out, uh, that we can help allocate. Regionalizing is, is, is the future, and, but regionalizing with regards to specific services that any one community can't support on its own. There have been local communities that have tried it. I know of one community that's local in particular that they spent over $100,000 trying to outfit, train, and equip their, uh, their very own SWAT team, and it fell apart, and it basically turned into a massive waste of money. Primarily because of the fact that you, it's unsustainable for any department under well over a, well over a hundred people. It's unsustainable to do it. You've got to be so for a resource like that, you have to go regional. With regards to communications, right? These things. It, it was I, I understand it was brought up beforehand. In the event of in the event of what we refer to as a mass casualty incident, are you going to be able to use this? There's no way because every single person is trying to use this, which is going to tie up the towers. One of the things that came out in the, in the aftermath of 9-11, and you know, this, is how, this is how slow the federal government oftentimes works, is something by the name of FirstNet. FirstNet is, its, is the first of its kind communications network that Doug can probably, probably has heard rumblings of it. it. It's a first of its kind communications network that is dedicated solely to uh, public safety so that in the event of a mass casualty, the cell phones can still work, communications can stay up, radios can stay up. Again, another major issue that in the aftermath of 9-11 that, that was discovered. Nobody could use, I mean, cell phones were in their, a little more of their infancy at the time, but nobody could use a cell phone for, for hours afterwards, um, which leads to chaos, which leads to confusion and panic and so on and so forth. Included with that, also is the radio systems. And if one agency can't communicate with another agency via radio, what good is the radio system? It, it, um, so it wasn't just with regards to the cell phone. So, but this year, Massachusetts just signed on to FirstNet. Governor Baker just signed on to FirstNet because they just launched it finally. 17 years later, we're finally getting this thing up and running. I can remember this being talked about shortly after 9-11 that, hey, you know what, we need, we need a dedicated public safety line of communication for cell phones that isn't going to get overwhelmed by, every, by the other 24,000 cell phones that are going to be used. In the event of, and this is something that we've talked about and planned for, in the event at Xfinity Center, at any given time there's 19,000 people up at Xfinity Center. That's, the po oh, just about, that's close to the population of the entire town of Mansfield. Yeah. In the event of any incident up there, do you think that our cell phones are going to be of any use to us? Absolutely not. So we have to have some sort of a plan to, again, contain the threat, contain resources that are coming, communicate, and coordinate everything with regards to both fire, EMS, public safety, and such. So that, in a nutshell, is that. Um, we, uh, we, We've taken a look at everything. Uh, everything has changed, and yet somehow has remained the same. But we've done things a little bit differently. We've looked outside the box. We've broken down silo walls. And it, we're, we're really on a path to try to integrate every single public safety organization in the big picture to solve problems. That's what we're doing. And so if you ask us, What's changed? That's it. That's it. And believe me, uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is not an easy thing to do in our services. Uh, you have some fiefdoms out there, and some people who don't want to give up that stuff. Uh, so it has been a challenge. We're blessed to have some really uh, forward-thinking, easy to work with people around us. Uh, that includes other communities and um, the chiefs and the, the officials over there as well. Uh, so we're, we're strive every day to get better uh, and to look at the big picture. The rec project is a perfect example. Perfect. 
I, I can't tell you how many times it's going to be. He, I can't tell you how many times he and I, one of us will call the other one and go, please tell me this is going to be worth it in the long run because this is a <laughs> lot of work. <laughs> and I like to equate it to, it's like having a 68 Chevelle in your, in your, in your uh, garage that you have in 5,000 pieces right now. <laughs> and now I've got to try and put this thing back together in a way that it's going to run like a top. But I promise when it's all done, it's going to be showroom quality. <laughs> but it's a lot of work. <laughs> so, do you have any questions for us? I have a question. Do you think it could have been prevented if the government had got more involved? What? 9-11. That's a bigger question than I, I can know, answer. You know, the, 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 the airline school called the FBI to tell them that these guys were taking pilot lessons and they didn't want to know how to land. So, you know what? I, 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 I'm just. So, here, here's what I know. Um, Objection, Your Honor. Counts for speculation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will tell you this that, that as we look back in, um, through history, uh, probably everything that we know, every event. Pearl Harbor. They changed the course of action. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. They oh, saw yeah. it on the radar coming Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Exactly. So, everything. I, in, in, when you step back and look at all the pieces that were there, you say, how could we have missed that? But the reality is, at the time, things that are in motion, you know, life is, it's, it's at fast pace, it's at real speed. It's not in slow motion. So you can't, you can't equate the ability to look back on history and begin to say, we could have, we should have. Yeah, yeah, we need to have some lessons learned from that. But the reality is, for those people at the time, for those people who were in charge, I, I, I can't be in their shoes. No, I know. And I'm believe me when I tell you that in public safety, things happen beyond at real speed. Yeah. They yeah. happen lightning fast. Because yeah, when you call it up on, on the internet, and it's got, you know, this, this person and the FBI, and it's that, yep. they didn't contact that. Like, it's hearsay, and could have, would have, should have, you know? But, but to that point, like I brought up earlier, the JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, that meets quarterly. Right. Right. Though during those is a free flow of information that goes out there, and they do. I can tell you that Hank Shaw is the um, is the resident agent in charge of the FBI in uh, Boston office, and he's outstanding to work with. Usually, I can tell you that if I if I send him a text, he'll give me a call right back. So, although you may have heard about. You know, well, the feds don't like to share information. Mm -hmm. They didn't. <laughs> neither did we. <laughs> neither, <laughs> neither did the state. It was, again, it falls back on the fiefdoms. And, you know, shortly after 9 11, the, the powers to be basically said, look, at, this, is, this is, again, lessons learned. We've got to stop with the silos right. of, of, of intelligence. We need right. to start sharing intelligence and start getting it to the people that need it so that things can be prevented, as opposed to we just sit back, we wait for things to happen, and then yeah. we react. Another question? Yes? I have a question about public Please. safety and the um, word spreading about 3D printed guns not being detectable by metal detectors and things like that. Oh. What's that? <laughs> What is that? Oh, that's for him. That's okay. for him. <laughs> I'm going to sit this one out. I'm sure it's only a matter of time before they get more sophisticated and can really work. Right? So, uh, yeah. There are no new problems, just new challenges. There really are. Yes. There really are. And as it relates to those, I think that I, I just, I find myself just saying, why? Why? It, when, as it relates to the whole... 3D printed guns, and we're going to put things out there. And quite frankly, you know, there are there are carbon fibers that are being designed right now that are that are metal detector proof. That like the, it's it's the it's the constant nature of evolution of any form of technology or business or and the such. I can tell you that I think it's a terrible idea. I on an epic scale, I think it's a terrible idea. I don't understand, and this is just my personal opinion. I don't understand why certain people need certain things, mm -hmm. but that's my personal opinion. Call them terrorists. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I'll say this much: I think that it does increase the it increases the availability of certain things where we don't want to increase the availability. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are struggling with on, not just on the terrorism front, right, mass casualty front. I mean, you see things, and the the other aspect of it. I'll get to that in a second. 
uh, on just not only on that front, but on the mental health front, right? We're struggling right now with mental health issues in this, in this country and identifying individuals that are escalating their behavior to such a degree that we can say, listen, we really need to, we really need to sit down with this person and we need to have a discussion and we need to figure out whether or not this person should have this type of a weapon or so on and so or access to and such. It adds an element of complication to it. The other, por the other portion to it though too is, is then what we're seeing on a, on a worldwide trend is that it's not so much the usage of firearms as it is the usage of vehicles and edge weapons that are being used increasingly as it yeah. relates to trying to commit. Because how hard is it to go out, try and rent a U-Haul truck and then identify some place that you can drive it? It's, yeah. it's a heck of a lot easier than finding access to a 3D printer and then, you know, or getting a, getting a fire. Massachusetts, I will say this much. Massachusetts has it all over a lot of most other states as it relates to how we screen people for firearms, license to carries and such. Mm -hmm. Whether it goes before the Department of, of Mental Health and um, you know, and whether it goes before the Board of Probation check, triple I check and such, and then basically you get this filtering through both the state and local resources. You get a filtering, again, breaking silos, sharing intelligence and information, and making sure that everybody is on the same page so that no one person is making a decision in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So I, it, as it relates to the whole 3D printing, I think it's a terrible idea. I, I don't understand it. I don't understand why. Well, I understand why certain people want it. I don't understand why certain other people are so vehemently in favor of it. The, the well, saving just, grace about those things is you're good for one shot. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's going to take actually physically <laughs> taking things out of carry-on luggage. Maybe they could be disguised to look like something else. Well, on my last vacation, TSA, <laughs> my wife was, wasn't happy with the fact that they, you know, let's face it, you're coming back from vacation, the kids got a lot of stuff. Yeah. You want to pack <laughs> everything carefully, right, so that you don't have to get that extra carry-on because <laughs> nobody wants to pay the extra for the extra bag. Yeah. And when we, get to the, when we get to the airport, before we get on the plane, unpack the bag and it's almost like a spring. Everything comes out yeah. and she's <laughs> like, oh, I spent an hour packing yeah. that and I was like, just cut them a break, okay? I'm sure that they get they get a ration of crap 1,200 times a day over it. So, uh, <laughs> you had a question? You had a question? I was curious about uh, what are the qualifications that you need to have to carry a firearm? Because I have some questions about some people I know who have license to carry, and as far as I'm concerned, they're what I would call an attractive nuisance, or worse. Well, we could talk about that offline if you want. <laughs> I'll say this much. I'll say this much on a local on a local, and I I'll just gloss over it very quickly. There are statutory disqualifiers under Mass General Law, and this means that absolutely under no circumstances should you. And then there are what they refer to as um, as um, as as unsuitability issues, and those are more for local police chiefs to identify. So for instance, if you have somebody who is increasingly having mental health issues, then, that's, could become, then that could become a, a suitability issue, okay? Um, I don't like to comment too much on it because it sort of steps into other people's jurisdictions, but the bottom line is, is, that, you know, is that as it relates to suitability, it's all about being consistent with it and whether or not you're consistent with, look at, you know, if this is an issue, then it's a suitability issue. And you know, if somebody had just because somebody's, as an example, um, if you've ever been convicted of a violent crime, or you've ever been convicted of a, 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 of a crime of, um, over two years that's punishable for over two years. Now, convicted means guilty, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if somebody has say eight assault and batteries on their record in the last couple of years, but they've all been either dismissed or continue without a finding. Technically, those are not statutory disqualifiers. But there's no way I'm giving that person a firearms license. So you know who, say in Mansfield, has a license to carry. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm so supposed to know. if you encounter them somewhere in a situation, you would know he's on it or something, you know? So uh, taking the ICS theory a little bit, to taking the ICS process to the next step, GIS in the town. 
we took the GIS map a number of years ago, and GIS basically you can you can look it up on the town's website. GIS you can go in and take a look at the take a look at you know the the whole community. We have layers though for public safety to the GIS. Yeah. So for instance, if uh, we get a report of a breaking entering in progress at you know 101 Main Street as one example, right, or whatever, hypothetically speaking, and our we can look on the GIS map to look at the layers to see if A, there are firearms in the house, mm -hmm. which is gonna add, a, it's gonna add, a, mm -hmm. a, it's gonna add a layer of complexity to that response and a number of other things all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we use GIS, not just, it, and again, this is where I'll pat the fire department on the back, the, the, the fire service began using GIS before us and adding layers and I looked at it and went, oh, I like that. I'm going to steal that idea. You, you did. It took him a long time. He, he, we talked about this. Uh, Doug, how long has that GIS been around? 15 years? Oh, yeah. For us? 14, What's 15 GIS? years. So, global informational system. Graphical. So, geographical, geographical information. information. It, it, basically, what it did was it allowed us to take all the information that we've had in our drawers, in our file cabinets, in our offices, and put it out to the guys in the field on a real time real emergency basis. So our guys going out the door, as well as the dispatchers, looking at the map that has every single building in town, every hydrant in town, every water main in town, every gas line in town, all the chemicals that are in buildings, where the fire alarm systems are, where the shutoffs are, all the contact information, everything that's pertinent to every structure in this community, including people with special needs, people who need help, and finally, 15 years ago, after we talked about it, and he was so excited and kept going back to his chief and at that time said, no, I'm not interested, um, finally got it put into a workable model for the police. Uh, so they get all that stuff now. So the officers, the firefighters, uh, and dispatchers all know going out the door, before they even get there, what they're looking at. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface, by the way, of the usage of GIS. There are so many applications that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on. There's so many other applications as far as getting real-time information out to the officer and the firefighters that are responding to the scene. The quicker they get the information, the better off they're going to be. And the example, and a good, a fantastic example of that is in the event of a response to a quote disturbance. A pos let's say that we get a quote possible disturbance call on some on a street by a passerby, and the officer is on the way there. And what if it turns out that there is a special needs adult that lives there, and the response with the lights and everything else actually exacerbates the condition? That allows the officer to tailor their response. To, the, to, suit the, to suit the needs of the citizen and to help de-escalate the situation. And that was a real-time story in which part of the model was built. Mm -hmm. That there was a, a young girl who had autism who was very vocal. She lived in an apartment complex. And uh, every time the girl would try to communicate, she'd get louder and louder and would feel more frustrated. And as a result, neighbors would call and it would go shift to shift to shift and for shifts later, every single officer that was on each different shift that responded there without any clue as to what he was about to get into. Mm. As it turns out, not only did the girl have special needs, the mom had special needs and medical issues, and she had a book in which you could communicate with her very easily as long as you knew where it was. Mm -hmm. So all of that stuff was put into GIS. So now officers and firefighters going to the scene knew exactly what they were about to walk into and how to communicate with her and how to deal with her. Uh, so, for instance, you know, if you have uh, um, a child who, uh, for instance, my son has special needs, and many of you have met him, and he seems like whew, he's got it going on. He's very social, seems like he gets it, seems like he understands it. He enjoyed Ozzy the other night. He had a great time at Ozzy. <laughs> uh, but the reality is that he, is, he truly is about an eight-year-old level. And so when you tried to give him direction, He's not very good at following directions. He doesn't quite get it. He needs a lot of attention to make it happen. And you can only give him one thing at a time, mm -hmm. or he doesn't get it at all. Mm -hmm. He loses it. So, um, you know, those are the little things, right? Subtleties. Uh, what we did, and this is why I say, you know, we, we haven't changed anything, and yet we've changed everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, part of, my, part of the concept, and I'm, I'm going to 
I'm going to brag. I'm just doing it. Okay. Uh, so part of the concept in developing GIS for me originally was something that I saw as a child growing up. I had an aunt who was special to me, which wasn't really an aunt. She was a cousin. But anyways, you know how that goes. Um, so she has special needs. And uh, frankly, there weren't a lot of special needs kids in town. And as she grew older, she was about this tall. She'd walk around with her doll carriage. It was Sally. For some of you remember Sally? Yeah. All right. So Sally was awesome, right? Mm -hmm. She was awesome. But if you didn't know Sally, you, would, you wouldn't know what to do with her. But so many people knew Sally. She could go from store to store, from house to house. And she would know people, and people would talk to her and take her in and deal with her all day long. But you know what? Our town grew. And people forgot who Sally was. And I saw her. People forgot. They didn't know her. And I thought, man, wouldn't it be great if we could go back to something like that? So we've taken this institutional knowledge and given it to people who have no idea. They didn't grow up here. They didn't know people. And yet we gave it to them. So now they know. So that's kind of, you know, some of the premise in which we, we really built the program for that kind of stuff is having that kind of information. So again, lessons learned from 9-11 mm -hmm. is, is have your information out to your guys. Make sure that you're able to communicate stuff, stuff you never were able to communicate before. Now they have right at their fingertips, maybe in a different way, but they have it there. The communication alone, 9-11, one of the biggest problems they had was nobody could communicate. Everybody was on a different frequency. And now we have the means in which our radios, when I talked about the changes in the radios, uh, one of the things we were able to do is, is have uh, a wide variety of channels, find a common ground, so a common channel, so that everybody at an incident goes to that one channel. Uh, we also have mechanisms in which we can go with radios that don't really, aren't really interactive, and we're able to have outside uh, mechanical means, uh, electronic means, that can actually connect them. And uh, really cool stuff. We have that, actually, we have a vehicle that does it right here in town. Our MEMA organization is holding on to that now. So, so that's some, some pretty cool stuff out there. Anybody, anybody else, any other questions? Yep. I just have uh, one frustration. Uh, this happens yeah, as a senior citizen. You know, your eyesight changes a little bit when you're a senior citizen. Mm -hmm. I'm up on 123 at night, and something is going on there. And I got everything red and blue is flashing very brightly. And I have the headlamps from a, from a police cruiser is in my face. And I'm the first one in line. If I were the second one in line, I would just follow the car and then there's the first in line and go in the right place. I know there's a policeman in front of me and I would love to do what he wants me to do. And he's as frustrated with me as I am with him. I'm sure he is. <laughs> so to that point, to that point, actually, uh, recently, there are there are. Um, I hope some of you have noticed that the lights have gotten pretty good. I'll put it that way, with regards to the cruisers. One of the one of the changes in technology recently has been that it used to be, you know, when I would get to a scene. I'd have to actively, you take the headlights and you turn them off because you're not blinding the people coming at you. And That's then, what he finally had to do. And, and, then, you also, and then you also switch the lights manually. Now that's two positions that you have to make manually. You have to make two decisions manually in yeah. the cruiser. But it depends entirely on what, the per, on, on, what the, on what the police officer is dealing with at the same time. So recently what they've done is, is they've got this really cool technology where as soon as the car goes into park, the lights dim, and it it changes it changes the light pattern as well. So that's kind of a local jurisdictional thing. I know that we've started doing it here, so that it can sort of like, you know, sort of try to fix that problem. Um, but that's again, it's a technology fix. But her problem was she couldn't tell what he wanted her to do. Can they get like bigger, brighter gloves or something? Like a big clown <laughs> glove that's like this big. Mickey Mouse gloves. Yeah, you know? that'd be they awesome. Their uniform at, so they they all liked it. At what point? So <laughs> I, I, I'm getting pretty close to going. You know what? 123. That's Attleboro, I think. So. <laughs> Easton, maybe. Easton, yeah, yeah Easton. Go ask <laughs> Easton. No, oh, oh, kidding aside, it is. I was trying to take the left turn mm. onto Richardson Street to get back to Mansfield. Mansfield. Yeah. Well, really <laughs> there you go. But so anyway, I, I, I wanted to do what he said, 
But you couldn't tell him. But what he, he what he did was he shut his headlamps. Then I could see him. Then it's just too him. much light. Yeah. I couldn't see him. <laughs> And I can't be the only one with that problem. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a question, too? Yes, I did. Um, kind of indirect to what um, this. But um, I was talking to a woman, and she said that um, she had, uh, I think what she called it, a poll list for when you, if you had an emergency text come out to your home and um, some immediate information. She said that you keep in your refrigerator oh, the emergency yeah. numbers. On and refrigerator. Oh, yeah. So it's actually, it's on the refrigerator. It's called the file of life. Yeah, file and of if life. you don't have one, we can get one for you right now oh, and I, give it to you. Yeah. yeah. She had it in, she had like her DNR and all that. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. All that stuff is in there. Uh, it actually originally began in the refrigerator and then they realize hey let's put it on the outside um hey i'll get this and hey look at that that looks good Ooh, cake. Uh, so uh, <laughs> cake. <laughs> so we'll we'll make sure you get one before you leave <laughs> do we have any other questions yes ma'am i have a question but i just oh, want to right. tell you guys the police lifting challenge was on oh, yeah. 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 Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, we tried to. We actually, so uh, I got to give credit. I got to give credit to Phil Seward and Tony Latanzio on that one. There was a lot of debate over which song to use. A lot of debate. And Tony was very passionate in, in, with regards to having that song. Apparently, he's a big fan of the movie. Uh, but the one thing that we wanted to make sure that we did from the very beginning was take the same, take the same philosophy that we're applying now on the streets, right? Which is to, in, I, the, the metric by which, and the, I guess this, sort of, this all ties into post 9-11, the metric by which we gauge success now isn't measured in citation numbers and arrest numbers and incident report numbers. The metric by which we gauge success now is the level of engagement with citizens that the officers have, whereby they can get, you know, they can find out what is actually the problem in the community in certain areas. And that level of engagement, whether it's at the schools, right, whether it's, we've, we've even gone so far as we have a community calendar now, with that, um, and again, I gotta give Teresa Murphy a big shout out on this one. She, her staff was huge on helping us put it together. Every month we have a list of all of, of community events, right? And we try to have the officers, we shift where the officers are depending upon where the heavy populations are. Because we know that every single day we've got 4,000 of our most vulnerable population right over on East Street in a very yeah. condensed area. So we shift officers. I don't know if you've noticed in the last couple of years, but there's a, more and more police cars you'll see over there because every single day not only do we have the two SROs, but we also have the, uh, we also do daily walkthroughs. I actually did a walkthrough yesterday myself, where you just, whoever's on shift will go check in with the office, walk through the school, say hi to the kids, you know, end up, I actually ended up having a chat with a parent who was having, her sister in North Carolina was having difficulty with the child, so I ended up having a conversation with her about that. But that conversation never happens unless I get out of the car, I go out and I'm actually engaging with the citizens. We tried to take that same philosophy, and that was the only prerequisite to the lip sync challenge was, is listen, engage, engage the community with it. it. This isn't just, every other one that I see, that's, it's all well and good that you've got, you know, the, you, you've got the police department and you've got the officers involved in it, and it's, it's, it's fun and it's, you know, it can be humorous and, and such, but it's, you know, throughout that, what I, the part that I loved most was the ability to be able to identify local businesses to get the kids from the high school involved in it. You know, we put it out through the athletic department. Anybody that wants to participate Saturday, come on over to Two Park Row. We're gonna be up there filming. The band came out, the cheerleading team came out. It was, you know, Dan Kipp, who's a teacher at a local parkour um, uh, uh, studio, I guess, they, you know, similar to martial arts, they teach parkour there like gymnastics. Dan Kipp, who was the star, basically, mm -hmm. of, of the Lip Sync Challenge. Um, he's one of the he's one of the teachers at that studio, and we gave them a shout out at the end of it as well. So it was it was a great opportunity again to take that same philosophy of policing, 
where we use engagement as the barometer for success, and we applied it to that as well. So I, thank you very much for pointing that out. I, but again, I got to give I got to give the credit to to uh, Tony Latanzio and to uh, Phil Seward on that one because they did they did the majority of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.